All right, welcome everybody, day four. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna kind of change channels here. The last three days we've had excellent real science-based, blow your mind, <clears throat> lose your mind type lectures. So we're gonna go to a little more uh, entertainment, a little more philosophy. Uh, I'm gonna violate all the stuff they say to do on pedagogical Twitter, it's a slideshow, we're not gonna interact, it's a story. Uh, we're not gonna have a campfire, marshmallows, and come lay off. It's not PC, it's super biased, because it's my journey, all right? So if you can't deal with any of that, then you know, leave, it's no hard feelings. So a lot of, uh, John's talk yesterday, I'm gonna violate a lot of those principles because I'm kind of old school and you know sometimes direct is time expedient. All right. So it's kind of an autobiography of sorts. So it's my interpretation and my recollection, and it's a lot of big ticket items. Uh, there's layers and layers to this process, this journey, but these are things that are kind of hot right now in my brain, my heart, as I mentor coaches and uh, kind of do the last few chapters of my journey. So for me, <clears throat> my sweet spot of coaching is when I get the science, the art, all my experiences and all the guys in my network all kind of in a dynamic system balance. And when I have that ha happening, my, my coaching level I think is pretty high or very productive, and it's easy for me to get lost. I get lost a lot in science, and I get confused by my network, and experiences are, are a cool teacher. They give you the lesson after you screwed it up. So I'm a, a graduate of what I call the University of the School of Hard Knocks. I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge or the London School of Medicine or any of these great universities. I went to a state school in Ohio. I was raised in, in the country on a dairy farm. Um, worked my way up from age group, junior high coach, to where I stand today. So these experiences are all part of this interface of art, science. I'm classically trained as a scientist. Uh, I have a master's degree in sports science. I don't know what that means. My undergrad degree was in science education. Basically, I had a lot of minors and they needed science teachers and I went in for a degree audit. They said, you can teach. I was like, great, I need a job. <laughs> and coaching was, I wasn't a very good athlete. I grew up in a period where you did whatever sport was in season. So you played football and in winter you skated on ponds and did ice hockey, you wrestled, you played basketball, spring you ran track, summer baseball. Uh, we didn't have soccer or lacrosse or any of those things. I've probably been all right at those. I was a pole vaulter in track and field, but we had 11 guys on our track team, so you did a lot of events. So we didn't have event limitations back there. Some meets you do 10 events, because 11 guys, you can't cover all the events. So my experiences are pretty broad, pretty diverse, but definitely not elite. So I think that to understand coaching, you kind of have to understand where people are coming from. So my philosophy centers around a definition of philosophy. So to me, philosophy is a critical study, and I emphasize critical, of basic principles and concepts of some branch of knowledge. So for today, it's athletics or movement or training or what have you. And why you're doing this is you're trying to improve or reformulate those tools that you work with. So my journey, uh, it, it continues today. Very little support staff, although we got a great one here. Very limited resources. Bus station, a talent pool. So I worked in high schools and universities for 30 some years. So you get a class of kids, you have them three or four years, and they're off and it's a new group. So it's constantly turning over. You think, well, you're here at Altus. Well, what you see today, next year you won't see because the Olympic campaign's over and it's four years before the next one and the numbers are gonna change. So it's always a bus station of talent pools. 
So support staff, like I, I ran the Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista for a year. We had no therapists, no sports psychologists, no nutritionists. We had nothing. I, w I was all those guys. I've been academic counselor, travel manager, operations manager, you name it. You know, I've had to do it because a lot of times I'm in situations where there's just, now I've been in some dreams situations in London. We had guys lined up for miles that wanted to help, and we had resources and budget, but we had some barriers too, things called ego, class warfare, you know, think best practice, scientific studies, all the shit we all fight every day. So sometimes just because you have the resources doesn't mean you have operational efficiency. So the majority of my work's been in track and field. So this is the, the Olympic Stadium in um, Athens. So it's biased because I work in a very unique sport with a lot of disciplines. I've coached national and world and Olympic and what have you, medalists and finalists and record holders in almost every event in track and field, from marathon to 100 meters to discus throwing, hammer throwing. So like I said, I had to wear a lot of hats as a young coach, and I just continued to wear a lot of hats. My role at Altus is primarily Johnson Combined Events. Uh, so it scales down. Like right now, I'm, I'm kind of known as a long jump coach because we got five jumpers, six, count and pair. We got six jumpers in the Olympics, so now I'm known as a long jump coach. Well, a few years ago, I was a high jump coach, and I was a pole vault coach for a while, so it's kind of flavor of the month. It's like, what athlete do you have? How are they doing? Okay, that's, like I was with a guy somewhere, he goes, well, talking about the job, he goes, you ever coach the job? Well, yeah, a few, like five or six national record holders, and uh, seven Olympians. He says, wow, well, what are you doing coaching the long jump? Because we got this idea you gotta specialize to be good. And I'm kind of the anti-specialization guy. So what's beautiful about our sport well, there's no place to hide. Like when you're in team, court, field sports, you can hide. You can blame strategies, the head coach, the general manager, the performance staff and all that, track and field. It, it's the athlete and the coach. And if the athlete does good, it's the athlete. And if the athlete does bad, it's always the coach. There's no place to hide. Those guys line up, there's 80, 90,000 people, there's billions on TV. Your work is analyzed by a billion experts. You ever sit there and watch somebody do something, say, man, that coach was stupid. I would have done this, this, and this. A billion armchair quarterbacks in our sport, and a lot of them paid big, big price to be the armchair quarterback. So for me, it's, it's been a lot of record keeping. Uh, this is what my den looks like at home. My wife just closes the door. She has drapes on it. She won't even go in there. Um, you know, I go through periods where I do a lot of analysis of previous records. I'm constantly compiling records. It's a lot easier today with electronics and PDFs and spreadsheets and Google Docs. But in the old days, it was paper and binders and uh, Anybody remember the old accounting books where you had the columns and different colors on the pages? It was a lot of that stuff. So what's my stance today? Well, I'm pretty holistic. I'm definitely a generalist and a, a universalist. And if someone says, where are you at? I think that's, those are kind of drivers that I try to stay true to. Um, and it's a prism or a grid that I see things through. It's never about me, it's always been a team around me, even if it's volunteer or, you know, however I've had to put it together through networks. So I use the term we a lot. So we use a mechanical driven model for training where mastery drives the program changes. So Andreas was referring this uh, the other day in round table. Uh, we don't move training parameters and programming until we have some mastery. So the danger of an annual plan or mesocycles is you can get married to the numbers where you're moving people along to the numbers and you haven't gone through acquisition, stabilization. 
So we're pretty strict about if you can't mechanically operate on all the menu items at a pretty high level, why are we going to change the programming greatly just because the calendar says change or there's something coming up? And for me, in, in this tighter hard science realm, biochemistry, CNS, fascial trains, collagen matrix, those are some of the key touchstones that, that I use that guide the programming. So I'm looking at how mechanically efficient are we and what's happening in these realms and those the big drivers for, uh, for programming. And, and I operate in spectrums. I, I think most true and well-researched paradigms and concepts are more spectral than absolute. That's a, a common phrase you hear here when you talk to staff is, hey, here's my question, and their first answer is, it depends. You know, where, where are you at on the bandwidth? What mailboxes this athlete belong in? So I really struggle with absolutist. The human body is super complex. It's three-dimensional, it's covariant, it's dynamic systems, it's fluid. People, you know, try to use linear reductionist equations. They get stuck on statics. Well, what about the hydraulic system of the body, the joints, the capsules, bursas, fascial layers? They're filled with fluid. Well, if you don't understand fluid dynamics and you're skewed and biased to statics, you got a problem. So absolutist <clears throat> kind of light my fuse. It's a network-driven resource system for all areas of influence. I'm a product, as I said yesterday, of networking, of coaching, education, and development, and people that have allowed me to question them or spend time in their life. <clears throat> and this network's ever-changing, ever-growing. At some times it shrinks and reduces, and other times it expands, depending on what's going on, where my interests are, my energies, who's available. I'm constantly looking for management schemes, like how do I simplify things, reduce clutter, reduce fog, white noise, and that gets into management studies and management science and research, but it's a constant search and evolution of management schemes. Ergonomics, people familiar with the term ergonomics, the study of work. So you go into a factory, you see how things are set up and how people are working, you analyze and you know, well, let's put this guy over here and this guy's left-handed, put him over there. That's ergonomics. So for me, when I look at sport before programming or coming up with a mechanical model or any of those things, cues, motor behavior, it's ergonomically, what are we trying to do here? What's involved here? What are the key players? What are the essentials, the fundamentals and the principles? And then you expand from there. So ergonomics is another grid that I'm looking through when I analyze things or begin to create things. Uh, John and I were having a talk this morning about supplementation and pharmaceuticals and so on and so forth. And it's the same thing for me with programming or teaching pedagogy. It's, I'm trying to find a task that does a lot of things. Yeah, in the weight room, I could come up with 10 really cool exercises, but I'm hunting for one that does what those 10 do. If I've got a running workout, sometimes we do hybrids where we're transcending a lot of energy systems and a lot of zones, yet respecting CNS and various biochemical things. But I'm looking for ways to use energy wisely. An athlete comes to the track, they've got a, they have batteries, emotional batteries, mental batteries, CNS batteries, hormonal batteries, immune batteries. And these things aren't infinite, and they interface. And if you start draining one battery, things happen. You guys know from your iPhone, when the main battery goes down, certain things get restricted. It's the same thing in, in sport and with athletes. So I used to take pride in multitasking, but as I get older, I try to get simpler and more unified in task. So sports sciences, you know, John and I were, you know, laughingly yesterday in the round table, we were both a little bit hesitant on science sometimes, skeptical, and the longer I'm in it, and I've spent my whole life in science, uh, probably the more cynical and skeptical I get about science, you know, with bad studies or tainted studies, or cherry-picked data, or just fraud. 
But we can't run from these entities. They exist and we can learn things from them. So there's quite a sphere of sports sciences that we try to involve in decision making and monitoring and education of the athletes and performance staff. And I think some, one of the, my pet peeves is performance analysis. You know, a lot of people say they're, they're analyzing performance. We've got wearables and GPS and all of this, but nobody's coaching the essentials. There's no quality control during the performance. Like how many people are coaching and analyzing start, stop, change in direction qualitatively? Not many. They may do it in practice for certain spheres or whatever, but there's this big gap in real time, real work where we're not analyzing performance. We say we are, but we're picking a few metrics and we're saying that's performance. Well, how's that GPS stuff worked out for rugby people? Is it useful? It usually tells you the obvious that you already know or it tells you stuff way too late. You know, and GPS was going to revolutionize soccer and rugby. Well, the advantage of some of us older coaches like Greg and myself, we've sit here, we've seen 8,000 magic bullets. You know, Swiss balls, Nordic hamstrings. We've, we've seen all these magic bullets and we've seen them, their flavor of the month for a couple of years and then boom, they, they're in the graveyard of magic bullets. So who's influenced me? Well, first guy is von Clausewitz, German military genius. He, he wrote a book that's loosely translated The Art of War, not to be confused with the Chinese tomb. Coach Telez, my number one mentor, he was coach of Carl Lewis and Leroy Burrell, people like that. James Oshman was a guy I met in the early 90s, and he kind of started the college and matrix revolution that we see today. So he works at Woods Hole in Massachusetts. And I really think that fascia and the hydraulic system of the body is an, a, a new science, a relatively new frontier. And I think it's going to be a major frontier as technology and research catches up to it. Einstein, obviously, like I said, I'm, I'm anti-reductionist and linear. And when you get into differential equations, string theory, chaos theory, and all of that, you probably get closer to the mark of what's going on in the human body in sport. Jean Piaget, anybody know the name? Swiss developmental psychologist. Now, I was fortunate to hear a lecture from him before he died. Uh, if you get into how he looks at developmental capacities of, of children, adolescents, whether it's movement or cognitive or whatnot, it's genius stuff. And a lot of my philosophy on how to interface with athletes or how to write programming is Piagetian in base. And then William James, how many people know that name? Uh, I think in terms of pedagogy, he was the guy that really opened my eyes to see the forest of, of the power of pedagogy. So pedagogy, if you're not familiar with that, that's the science of teaching, you know, how do you teach? So how do we teach teachers in America now? Well, you get, you know, because we want everybody to pass tests, you got to have a degree in your discipline. And they go, oh, yeah, you probably ought to have some management skills. So we'll do this student teaching thing, and we just throw you to the wolves. And if you got a good mentor, supervising teacher, maybe you figure a few things out. A lot of us don't. And so you graduate, you have your teaching degree, you get thrown into a nightmare job, and you're burnt out, and after two years you quit. The average teaching career of a graduating student right now in the United States is 2.7 years. Because we don't teach teaching. We don't teach how to teach. Subject matter is just part of teaching. And in, you know, what are we doing at Altus? We're trying to bridge that gap from all the knowledge you guys already have and all the internet and all the courses and all the manuals and teach you how to apply it. So you're standing by world-class people and pretty good coaches and you're seeing these processes. You're figuring out what are the essentials? What are the philosophies? When 
most of my questions from visiting coaches aren't X's and O's. It's like, why do you think that way? Or why do you teach that way? Or why did you say that? Or how did you know to do that? Or whatever. That's the art of teaching. That's kind of art, science, of pedagogy. And then motor control. I was a biomechanist by training. And I learned really early in the game, we know what the model is, relatively. And we can sit and teach the model to an athlete, but the athlete executing the model is a problem. Well, that's motor control. So we have this big problem going on right now with experts and philosophies and paradigms. You've got motor behavior people saying to do X, Y, and Z, and biomechanists saying, no, you've got to do this, this, and this. And the elephant is in the room. They don't understand kinesiology. So the biomechanists and the motor behavior people are asking athletes to do things that's kinesiologically impossible. So to look at that construct without interfacing motor learning, biomechanics, and kinesiology is a recipe for disaster, I think. So my program is kind of like Linux theory. How many people are familiar with Linux? So it's a free computer language that people all over the world contribute to. You know, Microsoft doesn't own it. Nobody owns it. It's, it's a separate language. So athletes, experts in my network, guys like you asking questions, personal growth. It's constantly evolving process through time. So uh, experiences, episodes, when I was a younger coach at LSU back in the late 80s, I had 75 athletes on the university team. I coached men and women's throws, men and women's jumps, men and women's combined events, and I had 25 post-collegiates. So I was seeing 79 athletes a day, and I was writing individual workouts. So I'd start writing workouts Friday night, go to practice Saturday, come home, write all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and after about a year, my wife just came in and said, this stops. Like, if you want to stay married and you want to see your kids, this stops. So you have one of those existential moments, like, she's serious. And how am I going to do this? <laughs> because everybody says you've got to have individual workouts and look how good we are because I'm doing these things. And like, if I, how am I going to do this? And so that summer, I just sat down. I put all the stuff out. And I was like, what's common? What are the essentials? What are the basics? What are the fundamentals? And so I started writing blueprints with ranges of percentages and ranges of volumes and intensities so that I could prescribe on a given day more accurately. And I could write a workout that covered a lot of groups or a lot of abilities. And so environment or circumstances improve the program, the Linus. So my wife is a big part of why I program today, how I program. So in program management, I think monitoring systems and methodology is constantly in flux. And I think you have to understand that. And monitoring systems are varied and vast, and they're fluid. And if they're not, uh, I have to question the efficacy of the monitoring system. And the same thing with methodology. Yeah, there's basic principles and philosophies and core values and whatnot in the methodology. But the methodology you'd use with a 30-year-old very injured long jumper and a 14-year-old age group long jumper is going to have some variance there. I think we're strong, and you've heard it before, that debriefs are critical. And we use them in a formal method after each micro, meso, and macro. Uh, military research is the key driver for how we do it. But we do debriefs daily. They may be small, they may be slanted, they may be skewed, but we know what the KPIs are for the debrief, and a few questions at the end of a menu item in a training day can give you valuable information that may tweak the programming for the rest of the day or the next day or the, towards the end of the week, or it may plant some seeds when you write the next cycle. Hey, we overcooked this, or we underdid that, or this is a problem. And then evaluation and peer reviews are constant. So people go, why do you guys open your doors and have people follow you around and whatnot? You guys are our audit system. You know, we want you to tell us, like, you know, we say we're doing X, Y, and Z. 
talk to the athletes. How are we doing it? Is it coming across? What do you see? How are your questions being answered? So you guys serve as a, an audit system, a peer review system for us in a relatively informal way, somewhat formal. Do we still do the, the write-up at the end? Nick? Yep. So we have formal and informal. So organizational format. So we kind of use a hybrid, what people would call a hybrid periodizational model for programming. And I realize there's people out there that say periodization's dead, it's bonk, there's no use to study Matviev and uh, Bompa and all of that. Well, if you don't know what's been tried or how it's been worked before, then you're starting over blind and your process is going to be forever. So I think it's important you study the classics and people versus Shonsky, Schmidt, Bleicher, folks like that. How have they attacked it? How have they done it? How have they changed over time? Why have they changed over time? So you got to start somewhere. Like when you look at all the possible menu items and things you can do, it's this big junk heap. How do you decide what to pull out and how to prioritize things? You have to have some kind of system. So my view of periodization, 10,000 foot view, to me, being a classroom teacher, it's a lesson plan. It's a hypothesis. And people get married and they get defensive and it's like my plan and you know it's got to be right and all these studies say it's right and my mentors say it's right and all of that. It's a hypothesis. If you guys truly embrace the scientific method, follow it. You write a program, it's your best guess. You're guessing. And I see people write eight-week programs. I'm like, how in the hell do you know what that person's going to be like on week eight today? You have some general ideas, but they're hypotheses. So the size of your programming and all that has to be harmonic with your hypothesis abilities to monitor, to measure, and for the athlete to exhibit or to go through. So for me, it's an, it manipulates exercise prescriptions. That's all periodization does. You, you have these prescriptions of menu items, things you want done that you want to see, and you manipulate them in some kind of logical, palatable format that makes sense. So what do we, uh, what do we deal with? Well, the big three is volume, intensity, and density. So the old classic single periodization, you know, those were the, the spheres of influence that we look at. But in some sports, some of these things can't undulate or move or change a lot. So like in our world, in the jumps, our volume and our intensity doesn't change much through the year. Like, how do you do an 80% acceleration? Like, it's not really an acceleration. How do you do a 72% speed run? You, you can't do it. Like, some things you have to do at a certain intensity, and some things are kind of locked in a volume, like you got to do X number to get effect, but if you overdo it, you get disaster, so sometimes that volume bandwidth is pretty small. So the only thing that we can modulate a lot is density. How often in a week or a month do we do it, or how much rest between menu items or between sets and reps? So that's what I mean about periodization. You have to have a hypothesis operational procedure that mimics or works with the athlete and the event and the discipline uh, that you're dealing with. So like I said, I'm a graduate of the School of Hard Knocks. So I'm kind of a believer in minimal effective dose. And I know that's getting hammered right now on the internet and Twitter and like, oh, you don't train guys. Effective. I'm not saying minimal dose, I'm saying minimal effective dose. Now, any of you guys want to try this out, we got a long jump workout Friday or Saturday, your choice, where we're going to do six approaches down the runway, 20 steps, haul an ass, you're going to hit a penultimate, you're going to take off, and you don't have to land it. You can just pop up in the air and hope to hell you, you can land. I guarantee you, you can't walk the next day. Just six runs, maybe 40 meters. Why? <clears throat> Your body's never went through those velocities, experienced those forces, tried to hold that posture, synchronize that way. You'll challenge rate coding, number of motor units and stuff beyond anything you've ever done in your life, if, unless you've been a long jumper. So that looks like a very minimal a dose, but it's effective. Why don't we do eight approaches? 
Well, we do in the autumn when the speeds aren't quite there yet. But this time of the year, we got some kids, if they do three or four approaches, they're done. The chemistry is crashing. So if, if you've ever over fertilized or you've had one of these spreaders, you know, it's never uniform. And so you got some areas that look like this and you got some areas that overgrow. Energy management for us is critical. And you gotta have a lot of metrics for monitoring uh, energy management. And energy management's not just energy systems or central nervous system uh, factors in the main, you know, like we said earlier, cognitive, emotional, mental. Like when we start teaching a lot of our menu items in the autumn, these kids are exhausted with fundamental work. Why? Because they're having to focus and process and work cognitively. Anybody ever student teach or lecture? The first few times you do it, when you're done, you're toast. You're absolute toast. Like I, I do a lot of workshops and stuff out of Goodwill and pro bono. They're like, can you come in and teach for three days? Yeah, and you get there and you're, you're on nine hours for three days. I'm flying back, I'm like in the la la land. Because the mental battle that you do when you're reading audiences and trying to stay on your slides and do all this kind of stuff is intense. The Q&As are intense because you people have spent money and their time and whatnot and you want them to feel like they got something out of it. So you're, you're constantly working. Why, why do lecturers sweat like pigs when they're up here? It's not just the heat or the light because we're working hard. So this energy management, understanding there's multiple batteries that are interconnected, some are parallel, some are series, is super important when you're analyzing program design. It's not just what's happening to energy systems or central nervous system. I'm a big believer that athletes are injured at birth. We come through the birth canal, even if we're cesarean, and things happen. You get dinged, and it's downhill from there. <laughs> You know, you, you're learning to walk, you fall down, you get boo-boos, you get scrapes, you learn to ride the bike, boom. You go to school, your you know, bully beats on you a little bit, your parents whip the shit out of you. You know, it, it accumulates. And what happens after acute trauma is compensation, right? You know, parents whip the shit out of me on my right hip, so I'm kind of walking on the left hip to school because I don't want the teacher to know my dad just beat the shit out of me. So pretty soon I'm walking like this all the time. I'm like, okay, I gotta get balance. You know, so this injury compensation thing sometimes is in there for life. What are we learning about concussion syndromes? You know, acute trauma has multiple ramifications on operating systems. So compensation of movement is a puzzle. And Everybody is asymmetrical to some degree. Like, world-class sprinters always have one stride that's anywhere from five to 10 centimeters longer than the other. Nobody's balanced. Why? Because one leg's in the front block, and it undergoes the most power of any step. So that leg's getting a huge workout every time that athlete does an acceleration. Way more than the opposite leg because you're already moving by the time that leg hits, so it's a different stimulus and input. So the power strength dynamics of your lead leg versus your rear leg, totally different. Well, how many excels or buildups does an athlete do in a five-year period? Millions. So is there gonna be asymmetry? Yes. When you have asymmetry, you compensate. So the art of a coach and a therapist is where is this tipping point? Where is this bandwidth? Like, is this compensation okay? Is this in their wheelhouse and they can still do it? Or is it intervention time? Should we do some therapy or should we go to plan B in the workout? Or if it's really away from that, like maybe we ought to not work out today. So the asymmetries we talk about, we, we all have it to some degree. So. Uh, in track and field, the pelvis and the sacrum are, it's a big rudder of the ship. 
And we have well-meaning therapists that get iliums lined up and balanced, and translating and moving, and the sacrum's just locked because they don't understand ligaments and fascial slings. So you got these iliums, three degrees of freedom, meets everything the course says and the textbook says, and this kid's just smoking hamstrings and adductors, and you're going, ah, oh, the SI's good. How many people, how many axes in the SI joint? According to Voyer, 27. What do most P PTs checks axis SI joint? Six to 12. There's 27. S sacrum, everybody thinks it's fixed. It moves. You ever fa fallen on your coccyx? It moves. So a lot of asymmetry starts here. How many joints in the foot? How many major bones that mobilize when you walk or run? Yeah. Quickly, you can say talus, cuboid, navicular, uh, cuneiforms, rays. It's pretty complex. So if any of those joints are asymmetrical, guess what? The food chain's going to pay a price. Joint hydraulics. So how many people are kind of up to speed with fascia and joint hydraulics and capsules and all of that. If not, I encourage you to get involved there. So if we do the math like on a bicep, and it's never agonist antagonist, there's co-conspirators and whatnot, and we have a 40 pound dumbbell and we lift it and we do the numbers from just muscle, we can't lift it. Now we figure in the hydraulics, the fascia, the fluid, and all of a sudden it makes sense why we can lift it. So does everybody understand what hydraulics is in the gross sense? You have a crane or a tractor and it's got these levers and through hydraulic fluid it can lift incredible weights and move things and whatnot. Well, the human body is a hydraulic system. So if joints are in bad positions, guess what? You've got bad hydraulics. If fascial layers and slings are restricted or choked or distorted, You've got poor fluid transport through those fascia. You've got bad hydraulics. So when therapists tell me the glutes are shut off, I go berserk. I'm like, or they're weak. Like this guy ran 10-0. He can squat 500,000 pounds. And you're telling me his glutes are weak. Give me a break. Something's not working. And what usually isn't working is the hydraulic system. And if the joints are in a bad position, you can do soft therapy tissue work till your nose bleeds and it's not going to get better, it's not going to get more effective. If a joint's in a bad position, you got to deal with the joint. Joints, the human body's like a, a pulley system, you know, block and tackle, you're pulling the engine out of a car, you got multiple flywheels. And you, so the soft tissue, the tendons, ligaments, and muscles are the ropes of this pulley system and the wheels and the axles of the wheels are your joint systems. So what happens if a, a pulley wheel gets impinged or distorted? The rope breaks. It's not rocket science here. But people fail to see this interconnection of how important joint systems are to soft tissue function and work. Little pet peeve, sorry for the rant. Movement aberrations may aid health and performance. Like we're always trying to get people neutral or balanced or symmetrical. Sometimes these aberrations or these asymmetries or these aberrations in movement programming or scheming actually helps. So I embrace failure. You know, I, I don't like it, but I realize that's how I learn, that's how I grow. This was a big failure. And this was about movement aberrations. And it shows you the danger of science. So this girl, Goldie Sayers, is a British record holder, 67 meters, I think, somewhere around there. Uh, it's fourth in Beijing. I think she'll end up bronze when all the dust settles. Very compliant, trains hard, not a good athlete. She's average. She's not strong, not powerful, but she's got a bullet arm and a feel for throwing the javelin. So it came, and she'd been through some surgeries, some injuries, and, I'm the new kid on the block. Would you work with me? Sure, happy to. So we get, and we go through all our tapes for the last five years, and we measure, and we got biomechanists that are awesome, and we're measuring, you know, is her right nose hole, like, looking up when her finger is here? I mean, we're, we're into it. We're leaving, no stone unturned. 
And the data said that uh, on the impulse step, a lot of times she'd take it up a little bit too high, she'd land on the penultimate step and collapse over a mortise and then throw. So there's this big loss in horizontal velocity and we did all the numbers and we go, man, if we can clean this up, you're a 70 meter thrower. And the numbers looked real. And we, I checked it out with five or six guys in my biomechanic, everybody's in agreement. Yep, that's what you gotta do. And she's gonna throw 70. And she's compliant, and she loves you, and you love her, and this is gonna be the campfire of all times. So we worked on this, and we came up with schemes, and, and the day it was morphine, and we were like, yeah, we we're salivating, we we're high-fiving, and it's just awesome. And we, and we get to January, and we go to Stellenbosch, South Africa, for a month-long training camp. Beautiful weather. Obviously, in London, this, this was summer, so she's got a hat on, gloves, it's raining, the wind's blowing sideways, and it's, it's about 12 degrees centigrade. And this is July, people are firing up the barbecue, so we had to go places to get, get good training. Yeah, Gordon's missing this with all his son. So we go to Stellenbosch, and we have different lengths of approaches, you know, five step and seven step, and she's got all her metrics, what she's thrown the last five years. So we do a five step workout, we're three meters off. And I was like, well, maybe when you put more speed to it, 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 it'll shift the other way. So the next workout we did seven steps and she's four meters down. I'm like, oh, this is going the wrong direction. And a little bit later in the camp, we did three quarters runs and she was a 62, 63 meter thrower. She couldn't break 60 and I was like, and she's starting to panic a little bit and I'm panicking like a lot. And I've got the biomac in his hair, and I got him by the collar. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? And, but best practice, and science said, and I'm like, okay. And um, so by the end of the camp, she, she couldn't even throw the javelin. She was just emotionally destroyed. And so I'm a logical guy. We're flying back, and I was like, this experiment, this hypothesis didn't work. And... Um, Confidence is a big thing for her because she's not a great athlete. She's not a powerful, strong person. So I was like, wow, we got to do something radical. So we get back and we're doing a workout here in the rain and it's cold. And I was like, I want you to forget all the stuff we're working on. I just want to have a free day where you just throw and you get back to when you were a kid and you're just feeling it and you go down there and don't worry if this is off or what. Just throw. And it took her about five or six throws to get back into that, that realm. And about the sixth throw, she throws 62 meters in the rain. I'm like, that was awesome. And the film guys are there, and, you know, and so they called me that night, and she, she went backwards. And I was like, what? She, she's doing what she did last year. I was like, well, but it went further. Well, you guys just not given enough time. It's like, okay, so now I got a battle with sports science and my athlete, myself, so we're going on. So we started analyzing how does she do multiple jumps? How does she Olympic lift? And she's what we call an end range driver. So when she, she needs to wind up on something a lot to put a stretch, she's not fast. She needs a slow, big, huge stretch before she explodes. So she's an end range driver. So by going too high on the impulse, amortizing way too much that gave her time to put a stretch on the arm to throw it. So all this good science almost wrecked her career. So sometimes common sense and logic has to um, carry the flag. So you'll see she'll go too high on the impulse step and collapse on the right, yep. But it went 62 meters. So be careful with science sometimes. So we feel that proper movements promote proper healing. So progression schemes and landmarks are way more influential than timelines. Uh, s and and rehab people and PT, everybody's caught up in timelines because best study and all of this and current practice and, you know, people heal different. Inputs are different. You know, if I got an athlete coming off labral surgery and they're getting acupuncture and they had stem cell and PRP, and we're doing our movement schemes, that, that timeline is gonna be different than somebody that's told to go home and don't put weight on it for eight weeks. And the ultimate return to form, I'm gonna win because that person that sat there for eight weeks just scarred up and healed shitty. 
So again, this is the same girl. Uh, she had an accident in the weight room, had hip labral surgery, and this is six weeks uh, post doing our dribble series. And it was the left hip, so you can see some asymmetry, but this is six weeks. The teen docs were having a heart attack. Like, she's on the ground, she's moving at six weeks. Why? What are you thinking? Well, four months later, she threw 65 meters. And she's had no increase in arthritis or range of motion. This is our Paralympic sprinter. So and with prosthetics, you have asymmetry. So you have to control it and get it in there. So when he came to us, he didn't know how to flex the knee on the prosthetic side. So we have to modify how he recovers on the able side and improve on the prosthetic side. But the principles and the essentials are still the same. He's going to hit angles and have reduced contact time and increased flight time. But the KPI for us was trying to get the, the knee flexion dynamics more harmonic to one another to reduce asymmetry. So when he came, he had all kinds of back injuries. He had floating bodies in the ankle and all this because the asymmetry was so bad. But through increased efficiency over time, those injury factors reduced manifoldly. So I, I hate training gaps. And for some reason, sports medicine people just can't get their heads around. They, they seldom understand the complexity of world-class training systems. They have zero understanding of training gaps. So what happens with an acute injury or a surgery? Uh, I want you to do pool workouts, and here's 10 PT exercises, and you know, eight to 10 weeks. Chemistry's changing. They're detraining all kinds of things. Our idea is we're going to train like you're not hurt. We're going to come up with a plan B or a plan C where we stay on the original plan. We're going to be as close to movement as possible. I got a grade two hamstring. OK, we're going to do walking drills. And we're going to do dribbles at different speeds and different displacements and different symmetries of recovery where we're putting a little bit of pressure on the system, but we're not injuring the system. But so many times, people just radically change channels. You know, what is a 320 pound shot putter going to do in a pool workout that helps him as a shot putter? He's not going to float real well, first of all. So his ergonomic work rate is going to be through the roof. He's going to use energy systems that he doesn't use. And you know how long it takes to go across a shot put circle and throw? You know, it's a couple seconds, tops if they're slow as shit. You know, and they're in the pool for 30 minutes. Like, yeah, well, it's rehab. Well, it's stupid. So plan B, menu items, we feel have to remain as close to plan A as possible. And I think this is a huge issue, a huge mistake. So this is Scott Morales. He's a javelin thrower, uh, Paralympian GB. And he came in, and, and for, when we got there in England, they babied Paralympians. You can't do this. You can't do that. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. So I, you know, he gets his workout, and he goes, Coach, like, I can't clean. I'm like, well, why can't you clean? He goes, well, the prosthetic has to well, single leg clean. Well, how do you do that? And well, what about my other leg? I said, do you know what cross education is? No, I said, well, here's some reading. Read on it. So this is first week, single leg clean. And this was a guy that wasn't allowed to clean and told he couldn't clean, and he's cleaning. So he couldn't do plan A because he's missing something, but he can do plan B. So injury patterns, they can be top down or bottom up, you know, atlas occipital, TMJ, can create all kinds of problems. Drop talus, frozen cuboid, sprig ligament torsion on the navicular, big problems. Like we already talked about ilium, sacrum, SI. So these, these various rudders of the ship in human movements, cervicals, mid-thoracic, which Kelly did a nice job of Monday, pelvis, and feet. 
People say, well, what do you, how do you start looking at movement and all that? Those are the first riders that we look at every day. When they're walking from the car park, I'm scanning. What's their head doing? How's their neck moving? What's going on in the hips? What's going on in the feet? What's happening with the shoulders and mid-thoracic? So axes of movement are critical. You know, a longitudinal axis of the body, tra transverse axis of the shoulder, the hip, longitudinal axis of the foot. You know, what's happening? Pronation, supination along that long axis. So when we're looking at movement, we're always analyzing axes. Long axis of the body, what kind of oscillation and undulation is there occurring? So when we sprint, the shoulder axis and the hip axis actually undulate and oscillate as we move down the track in opposite phasing. So the, the hip on the, on the knee lift side is higher and in front of the support leg, and then it interfaces. So there's undulation and oscillation of the hips as you run, and the shoulders are in opposite phasing. Well, guess what? There's a mesh point there that's in the lower thoracic where there has to be rotation. If you don't angulate the arms in harmony with the legs, that fulcrum moves down, and now the lumbar are doing, picking up the rotational torque. Lumbar will take rotation, but they don't like it. They want to do flexion extension. So a lot of lower leg injuries are coming because the fulcrum is wrong in the spine when they're moving. So these axes and these fulcrums, I think, are critical. And then tensegrity. How many people are familiar with the word tensegrity? If not, you probably ought to figure it out. To me, the human body is just a big tensegrity puzzle. And what's cool is biochemistry has a lot to do with these connectors. So you, and then fluid dynamics have a lot to do with how these connectors and these levers move. So you can't get reductionist and isolate on an entity or a principle because they're all harmonic and dy dynamic. I think biochemistry is delicate and not really understood. No disrespect, John. Um, and I think it's easily influenced, both positively and negatively. Uh, one person can take supplement X, have great results. For another person, it could open Pandora's box for problems. <clears throat> one training menu item may work beautifully on this athlete. For another athlete, disaster. KPIs, what is a key performance indicator? To me, it's a double-edged sword. I think they're real, and I, and I account for them daily. And I, I think the double-edged sword is there's things that we do that indicate progress or good performance, and there's things that we can do that inhibit. So when we do KPI analysis, we're looking for things that are promotive, but also inhibitive. So, what are some of the KPIs we place upon the athletes and our performance staff to monitor? Technical, obviously. We have a model for everything we do, every menu item. If we're doing a lift, we have KPIs for that lift. If we're doing a warm-up drill, we got KPIs for it. If we're doing a multiple throw, we have KPIs for that menu item. So whatever the menu item is, there's a technical model that we're teaching towards or that we're using to analyze efficiency and functionality. There's physiological and genetical KPIs. So when we were talking uh, with Jeremy, you know, we had a girl that was 0 for 5 on recovery genes. So that genetics drives the programming. This girl doesn't recover. She can't train every day or back-to-back -back days. Wellness. What are some of the wellness and, and lifestyle, they oftentimes interface. Sleep, hygiene, diet, nutrition, social stressors, uh, relationships. How many of us coach an athlete? Abusive relationship, they get out of it and you go, thank you. And you look up a month later and they're in one that's even worse. And you're like, well, I think my programming's off. Your programming's off, they're off. Uh, sorry, not PC, but they're off. Now, how you deal with the off, you know, that maybe uh, John's talk's a better way to do it, but sometimes I'm like, you're just off. Like, we got a problem here. You don't see this pattern. Mental, emotional KPI. So Greg and I and Kyle 
kind of team coach, and we had uh, five what I call elite vaulters this year, female. And physiologically, you know, they had some sickness, illness, all that, but they were ready. Physically, they were fine. Technically, they had meets or practices where they were world class. But we told them at the beginning of the year, your emotional control and mental resilience are your KPIs for the year. And they tried, and they worked things and all that, but they didn't get there. And so at their various Olympic trials or whatnot, it wasn't that they had bad coaching or they weren't in shape or their technique or their model was wrong. The KPIs for mental and emotional strength functionality failed. Now some of that's on us as coaches, a lot of it's on them, how they weren't transparent or didn't work it as well as they could. And then lastly, like environmental and sport knowledge KPIs. You'd be shocked when we interview athletes coming into this program, we go, do you know who the top five people are in your event? Nope. So you don't even know how they train? Nope. Do you know what their performance cluster is for the season? Nope. Do you know what their performance cluster is for headwinds? Nope. Tailwinds? Nope. Bad weather? Nope. Do you know any of their lifting metrics? Nope. Like, then how do you, you, you tell me you want to go to the Olympics, you don't even know where, where the map is. So sometimes sport knowledge and environmental KPIs are a big limiter. If you don't know what your opponents are doing, what's a SWOT analysis? If you don't know what your opponents are doing, how, how are you going to play or how are you going to judge success or progress or whatever? What are you training towards if you don't know what you're training to? So I think mental training, it's got to be complex, it's got to be systematic, and it's regularly practiced. So a lot of these girls that we were talking about previously got super serious with a month ago using sports psychology and uh, following coaching guidelines. Greg even printed a shirt that said, but. Why did he have a shirt that said, but? Because they would come down and do something, and they'd hit the KPI we're working on. They'd get out of the pit, and they'd say, but I felt this. You know, instead of focusing and rewarding themselves, for the KPI, they're on to the next channel. They're over managing. So the regular was neglected. Whether it was cost or time or, you know, there's a myriad of excuses, but it wasn't regular. If it's not regular, it's obviously not systematic. So there's plenty of research being done on that sort of thing with military. I think personally, training groups and integrated sport teams are essential. And I think that's part of the reason why Altus has had a couple of good years is because we have good performance teams and we have good training groups and uh, people feed off each other and it speeds up the learning curve. And a lot of time um, in debrief settings or peer reviews, you know, a peer will say something, the same thing we've said as a coach a hundred times because it's coming from a peer phrased a different way with a contextual support Boom, the light bulb goes off. So, you know, I, I fight a lot of federations. They want us to train at a main training center. I'm like, but there's nobody there. Like, who are we going to train with? Uh, and we want you to be in this meet series. And I'm like, okay, I got a 690 long jumper, and the next long jumper is 605. How's that, how's that going to help us? So having peer and uniform groups, I think, pretty important. So we demand that athletes become PhD here. You know, we, when they leave or retire or whatever, we want them to know the, the gauntlet, biomechanics, motor learning, therapies, sports medicine, nutrition, whatnot. Um, because it, it raises the level of reporting, it raises the level of debriefing, we want people at a very high level. A comment we get from ACP courses, athlete or is warming up, sit down on the training table, tell the therapist X, Y, and Z, and then they're like, wow, like my athlete doesn't even know where the hamstring is. You know, well, they didn't start out that way. It's a culture that you have to teach and develop and promote. And I believe strongly athletes must take extreme ownership. I think uh, John referred to it yesterday in his lecture. You know, coaches can't be working at it harder than 
than the athlete. And you say, oh, it's kind of cliche and that's a given, but how many of us hold athletes to this accountably every day, every cycle, every year, every competition? It doesn't have to be like white knuckle accountability, no, but you have to call bullshit when it's bullshit. This is a hard one for me. I'm a slow learner. It took me about 10 years before I figured this out. But I truly believe this. And you think at 44 years and the record and CV I got, it should be easy. It's not. I got probably half my team, every day I got to convince them that what I'm thinking is even close to being true. So it's a trust project, and you know, whether it's academic knowledge or conversational tone or the techniques that John referred to yesterday, all of those things go into the equation for, for building this. If you think just because you move up the ladder and you're working at a certain facility and you got a bunch of letters behind your name that you're gonna be accepted and believed, you haven't worked long enough, in my opinion. Is that earth shattering to people? How many people already knew this? Yeah. For me, the best form of training is doing the event. Uh, I think drills and teaching progressions give context, they build file systems, they can de develop routing, main trunk routing, and all of that, but Transference is optimized when you're doing the real thing at real time, real forces, real task. So we have gym, uh, pole vaulters that do hours of gymnastics and plyometrics and all of this. And they may have a place, they may add context. Like if you're a young pole vaulter learning body control and movements and how to change levers and all that, the gymnastics may have a higher ranking in the KPI list, but if you're a world-class pole vaulter and you're 30 years old, this is wasted heartbeats. Totally wasted. This guy's running 9.3 meters per second. When he plants the pole, five to six times body weight going through his spine. There's actually whiplash on a skull and neck at takeoff. And then he hangs his underwear upside down at six meters on a pole that's moving in three dimensions, and he lands in the pit and gets whiplash again. So the, a pole vaulter undergoes double whiplash every jump with five to seven times body weight forces, and then the force from falling from six meters, I haven't figured that one out. And you're gonna tell me this shit prepares you for that. <laughs> it fails the logic test, doesn't it? Watch what happens to his head and neck and his spine. Now watch the pole, it's bending all over the place, it's crazy, the wind's blowing him, he's got a contort. Now how are you gonna do that on a fixed apparatus? I think the best form of event specific training is competing. And people don't respect competing. Like, when you compete, you're doing it all. You're doing accelerations, you're doing plyometrics, you're doing speed, you're doing mobility, you're doing all kinds of stuff at a super high level. And so people will compete on Saturday and they come back, well, it's Monday, we gotta train. I'm like, no, don't train. You just went through super training. And why do we have the problems we have in soccer in Europe too many comps, no time to recover. They're, they're, they're not understanding that this is super high training. So this is a Korean guy, he was bronze medalist at World Juniors. This kid, it was really interesting, he could not jump two meters in practice. Like, couldn't jump, and he could go to a big meet like this and jump 224. Because his timing and his systems and all of that needed that stimulus to get that kind of workout in. And 
the coaches were like, he's weak in the weight room, he's failing the plyometric test, and uh, his mobility tests are terrible, and you know, we've done the, what is that, the Omega Wave, and he's not ready for training, and all this science shit. And I said, guys, every major you put him in, he's meddled. There's something else going on here that you guys are overrating, like training. Training's way overrated. You laugh. I, I think we're married to numbers. We gotta train six days a week, two or three times a day. Really, do you? I got plenty of examples where I'll show you you're wrong. So I think competitions train many systems and many menu items simultaneously. Sport specific and event group classification things. So when we look at athletes, we look at body prototypes like injury risk factors, architectural factors, anthropological, biological systems. These are just some of the grids that we analyze athletes to put them in a mailbox. So let, let's use long jumpers for example. There's about five mailboxes you can put a long jumper in. So we got one, Fabrice Lapierre, Australian. He's about 5'10", 9, 145 pounds. No muscle mass. 100K power clean would be like a great day, high fives. Fast as hell, elastic as hell. Work capacity, zero. Like. If he does a jump session, you better give him about five days off. He's a greyhound. He's a thoroughbred. So he's one mailbox. And you got Greg Rutherford, the British guy. So Fabrice was silver at Worlds last year. Greg was gold. Greg, thick, medium converter, fast, powerful, like 26 meters overhead back throw with a 4K shot. What was his step up the other day? 250 kilos on a low box step up, he can clean 150K. He, but he's got architectural problems. He's pigeon toed and bow legged. So he's had 17 grade two hamstring tears on one leg, 15 on the other, four or five foot surgeries on one, and all that. He's got a Maserati engine and a Volkswagen chassis. So all of these things determine which mailbox they're in. Christabel Netti, our Canadian jumper, she's kind of the middle on everything. A middle converter, middle speed, middle power, middle work capacity. She's kind of in that middle mailbox. So you gotta know what mailbox to, to drive programming. Can I train any of these guys alike? So we got six people going to the Olympics and there's some essentials and common denominators out there, but none of the six work out even look remotely possible. So today, nobody was out there. We had one guy do a pre-meet warm-up and another guy did an Excel workout. And three others were totally off. Because they're different. They, they, they have different body prototypes. So when we look at body systems, these are some of the, the things you know, that we monitor and look at and that we use as touchstones and signposts for programming and classifying athletes. So we use generational menu item selection schemes with all training qualities. So the best way to think about generational menus is like a family tree, like a family history. So this is a tree I found in Japan and they, every generation they graft a different genus and species on this thing and the, the net is pretty incredible. So we use generational constructs. So some training menu items are teaching progressions to higher degrees of specificity. So they're lower generation. If we're doing a drill or a teaching progression, that might be fifth generation away from the first generation. The first generation is doing your event in the Olympic Stadium. The fifth generation may be doing a drill or a warm-up exercise or an ancillary lift. So some training menu items serve as mental or neurological or brain plasticity reference points or perceptual grids. But they don't ensure transference. They build filing systems and routing systems, but they don't ensure transference. Some of these training items will build platforms for more special work, more specific work. So do we do general types of work? Yeah. Do we spend a lot of time on it? No. Is the density great? No. We're doing it to build platforms. 
So the dosage of it depends on what you're trying to do with it. So let's look at a pole vaulter, for example. So a competition length vault is first generation. Are you coming from 18 to 20 strides? How high is your grip? What's the flex of the pole? What are the weather conditions? It's shit and get time. It's, and people can die in the pole vault if you don't pay attention. So it's serious. So that's first generation. Second generation would be short run jumps and exercises like moving the standards, being on a soft pole, being on a stiff pole, but it's a reduced run. And maybe it's 10 steps or 12 steps. So we have a little lower velocities, a little less forces. Third generation would be things that support that work. So acceleration runs, speed runs, various jump and plyometric exercises. Fourth, general plyometrics, weight training, gymnastics, alactic runs. Why? Well, 12 jumps, 90 minutes, you, you may get into an alactic factor there. Notice there's no anaerobic work in here. There's no classic aerobic work in here. They're like 10th generation. We're not, why are we going to spend time on it? Like a high jumper takes 12 jumps in an Olympic final over a 90 minute period. They run 30 meters. Why do they need anaerobic capacity? So very little general or fifth generational work. We, and any of these lower generations, we've got to see that they truly support the first two generations. Does that make sense? So we respect dynamic systems modeling, but I got some questions. So this is all the, bit, the rage now, dynamic systems and variance and all that. Like how much variance do you need? So, I don't know how it is with your clients or athletes, but my athletes come and they're never the same. Like sleep, diet, nutrition, stressors, weather, injuries, compensation patterns, they're already different today than they were yesterday. We got headwinds today. Well, maybe that's enough variance. Like, do we have to put even crazier variance? Some things are more, more operative in open chain versus closed chain, okay, I understand some dynamic system variance there. But one of the things that I see working with a little, a lot with middle distance runners is, do they have landmark workouts? Do they have workouts throughout the year where they know where they're at? They don't have to be the same workout, but they need to be in the same family. So many people are in the variance and keeping it interesting, and oh, I got ADD people, so I gotta change shit up. Like, they never know where they're at. Like think about it. guys in here that lift or whatever, you got some key workouts that let you know where you're at. You, you got these time tested, and if I do five by two on the bench, I kind of know where I'm at or something like that. Athletes need those landmark sessions. And organizational adapter spectrums, like how are we adapting in an organizational sense with these dynamic systems? So we, we constantly monitor staff and athletes for confirmational bias, and I, I, I'm pretty guilty of this. I mean, you know, you have this aha moment, it's like, I did all this research and all that, I already knew that. Like, GPS, I was working with an NFL team, and they gave me the GPS data, and it was like, these guys can't do X. I'm like, well, that's obvious, like, they didn't even finish practice. <laughs> you, you needed all this technology to tell you this guy can't do X. So that's it. A lot of other layers and things like that. And uh, it's a, a big ticket item on my journey and where we sit today. So we're going to take a 10 minute break so we can kind of reorganize and then I'll take questions and whatnot on the pool shot. All right. <laughs>